All right, thank you for the visual cue. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, as uh, Thank you, Alan, and thank you uh, to everyone at the ITMS for the, the welcome and the opportunity today. Hopefully you can see, I believe you can see the, the title slide uh, of our paper uh, with my colleague, uh, Mike Carey. And uh, let's, let's get started. So strangers and aliens no longer, the experience of a monastic hos hospitality and community in a hybrid graduate leadership education course. So to kind of get started, I once upon a time taught uh, public speaking and rhetoric. So I like to preview my main points. So here's the roadmap for our the next 10 minutes together. Uh, I'll begin with some undergirding assumptions uh, inspired by Vatican II, kind of set up some uh, you know, signs of the times uh, in kind of a, a life and organizational context, many of which everyone will be familiar with. And then some of the literature in our field of leadership and management that is encouraging us and uh, interested in leveraging contemplative contexts like Benedictine monasteries. And then uh, somewhere between bullet point three and four, I will pass the baton to my colleague, uh, Dr. Michael Carey, and then he'll talk about how we've integrated elements uh, from uh, Benedictine spirituality, insights from Merton, into this hybrid graduate leadership education course. You'll see some photos, get some uh, quotes from students about how they've experienced it. And then uh, we'll revisit this slide and recap and tell you what we told you, okay? So that's what's happening. And here we go. So some undergirding assumptions. Uh, this is uh, Dr. Teresa Rothhausen. Uh, she's a professor of management. She's the executive director for the Center for Leadership Formation at Seattle University. And so she's been really doing some interesting research, just really pushing uh, people that we, the world needs to change. Organizations, business needs to change away from a transactional to a more values-based, love-oriented uh, way of perceiving uh, things, which, you know, can uh, get people a little bit uncomfortable if they're interested in maximizing shareholder wealth. Um, um, a couple of assumptions that kind of uh, undergird this for us too, our sense of uh, a general, a very broad definition of spirituality, kind of a search for inner identity, connectedness, and transcendence, whatever that might look like, folks. Some uh, quotes that uh, will probably be familiar to a crowd like this, uh, Benedict and spirituality, so appropriating the truth of scripture, and living them out in community, what community might look like for you. And then uh, this tradition is an opportunity to kind of withdraw and then to balance, you know, work and prayer, uh, this search for spirituality. And then, um, and then ultimately moving our hearts to a place of overflowing love, you know, from the prologue, from uh, the rule. Uh, again, kind of hearkening back some of the context for Vatican II here, and then uh, this Land of Lakes statement that emerged after uh, Vatican II, and some folks that got together that they thought that the Catholic University is a place where you kind of look at these different relationships between ideas and problems, you know, so that they can all touch each other, and nothing, everything shouldn't necessarily be in isolation. Uh, that there's often a philosophical and theological uh, dimension to uh, every intellectual subject if you kind of pursue them far. So those are kind of some of the big, big ideas and why leadership and spirituality and theology might be together. Of course, we're at Gonzaga. Thank you, Alan, for pronouncing it correctly. <laughs> um, uh, and uh, the Ignatius' spiritual philosophy, the exercises, you know, that are kind of actualized in the teaching process, you know, context, experience, reflection, and action the Ignatian pedagogical paradigm that uh, hopefully uh, Ignatian educators utilize regardless of discipline. Uh, Father Kolbenbach had this great quote about when the heart is touched by experience, then the mind can be challenged to change. Uh, Teaching to Transgress is a book by uh, Bell Hooks, the uh, educational thinker, and she often talks about to create a community and we generate excitement by you know, having other voices heard and uh, getting interested in people's stories. And that's how you really create a, a life-affirming classroom community. So uh, Michael and I are very committed to that. And of course, we're at a Merton conference and uh, Merton had some ideas about education. And, um, uh, you know, so he, he, he mentioned in this 1979 quote about, uh, you know, authenticity and uh, figuring out uh, a relation to the world and, uh, you know, how can uh, people be themselves into it? in it and enter into this, um, right, in a living and fruitful relationship with one another, with the world. And, uh, you know, uh, 
Uh, another quote about learning too. Learning to live is recognizing and becoming at home with oneself, learning who one is and learning what one can offer the contemporary world, and how to make that better. So these are among the, the, the ideas undergirding us a little bit. And those, so some signs of the times, even before the pandemic, a very frenetic breakneck pace in the work, modern workplace, you know, running, 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 doing, doing, doing. Obviously, um, you know, the pandemic has really, uh, really taken a toll on us. This is just from the New York Times, a, a nice graphic from uh, March 2020 to 21. Uh, what it's done to healthcare and healthcare workers, right? And just wearing people out, exhaustion. What it's done to contemporary work life and juggling family and work together. And uh, this was a nice photo from the Washington Post. And this this is another one from there too, just uh, people juggling parents, you know, cats crawling in the background of, uh, of our Zoom screen and, and everything involved. And so it's a, a very turbulent, compl complicated time and context in which personally and professionally all of us function. In. So in light of that, even before uh, the pandemic, you know, lots of scholars in our world have been you know, maybe there's something more. Maybe we should explore uh, these historically unfamiliar contexts to help us uh, have more satisfying work and create a more life-affirming workplace maybe. And because it's so frenetic and nonstop, you know, what about these retreat centers? What about monasteries that have different aesthetics, different routines, a different, you know, culture? And how might we harness that uh, and adapt some of that in the organizational business world, but in our, you know, where Michael and I come in into education and we teach in uh, a leadership education graduate program. And so uh, this piece is from, uh, you know, looking at mindfulness, but uh, there's a, a movement right now that's called workplace spirituality in, uh, in leadership and management studies that people are really interested in looking at things like mindfulness and then borrowing from like, you know, Ignatian spirituality, Benedictine spirituality, Buddhism, et cetera, et cetera. And so th all of those uh, backdrops, those contexts kind of inform uh, our paper today and why we would, uh, you know, Mike, who's, Mike who's done this work for a long time, would create maybe a class related to uh, leadership and community and looking at their intersection together in a graduate program in organizational leadership. And uh, with all those things in mind, at this point, I'd like to hand it over to my colleague, uh, Dr. Michael Carey. Thank you, Yoon. Um, and um, I'm going to, uh, I'm not quite as comfortable just uh, speaking uh, on the cuff as uh, my colleague Yoon is. So I'm just going to read uh, from our, uh, the paper we put together, but um, you'll see some slides that will kind of go along with that. So. Uh, leadership and community is offered as an elective course within our servant leadership concentration in the graduate organizational leadership program at Gonzaga University. The hybrid course begins in an online environment and then brings the students and teachers to St. Andrews Abbey in Valiermo, California for a one-week immersion with the mon monastic community there. The course is not meant to be a comprehensive academic examination of Benedictine community life. Rather, the course uses the lived experience of a group of Benedictine monks as a metaphor for what is essential to any experience of community in any organization, even if the community has nothing to do with religion or spirituality. And it seeks to draw insights into effective leadership by using that metaphor. Living with the monks for a week, the students experience the rhythm of their life, of their life lived in community, and experience the rituals the monks engage in to continually bring them back to their mission. The students begin to understand why an individual monk feels compelled to be in relationships with other monks in community in order to reach that individual monk's own goal of spiritual development. As a result of their experiences with the monastic community, students are better able to understand why any community, secular or religious, is absolutely necessary for the individual to be all that they can be. The particular monastic community that the students in the graduate course live in for a week is St. Andrew's Abbey in Valermo, 
a small Benedictine monastery in the upper Mojave Desert of Southern California. Gonzaga graduate students would not be able to have as complete an experience of the actual day-to-day, hour-to-hour life of a monk if they stayed at any other monastery than St. Andrews, <clears throat> as there is usually a maintained distance between monks at most monasteries and those who visit them that is not present between the monks of Valermo and the students of Gonzaga. And this has been the experience of both Valermo monks and Gonzaga graduate students for the last 16 years. There are multiple reasons why this is true. Hospitality, the welcoming of the stranger, has been a primary characteristic of the monastic community at Valermo since its founding in 1955. And in the integration of what they have learned from the one week immersion at St. Andrew's Abbey, students consistently share that hospitality is one of the key dynamics that they need to bring back to their own secular organizations. Students learn from their experience of the monks hospitality that the invitation and welcome they feel changes how they encounter the rhythm of life and the rituals of both prayer and work at the monastery. And from their interviews with the monks, students also realize that the hospitality does not merely produce a change in those being served, but that hospitality changes the person providing it as well. In his essay about Merton's understanding of hospitality, Paul Pearson wrote, quote, whether in a family or a monastic community, the capacity to be hospitable to strangers is profoundly related to the quality of the relationships that we experience within those environments." Unquote. For Terence Cardung, Merton's monastic perspective on hospitality was shared by the rule of Benedict and the teachings of Jesus Christ. He wrote, quote, could it be that Benedict wishes the community to be well aware of its own humble status as strangers and guests in the house of the Lord. When we extend hospitality to a stranger, we are not acting out of the magnanimity of that the landowner prefers to the landless traveler. As monastic stewards of the Dominus Dei, we are merely extending the merciful hospitality that the Lord once showed us." Unquote. Through their experience of monastic hospitality at St. Anne, Andrews Abbey and the scholarship on community and Benedictine spirituality, our students explore and practice empowerment, collaboration, and dialogue in the context of creating structures and processes for sustaining and transforming community. The graduate students in the course experience the monks doing this with them during their week living at the monastery, and it blows them away. It is transformative. And so our students, who are Christian, Jewish, Muslim, Buddhist, Hindu, agnostic, and atheistic, all leave their one-week immersion in the monastic community realizing that if they can make every person they encounter in their own organizations feel special, unique, important, and attended to, then that level of hospitality will be transformative to those in their organizations as well. For example, consider the testimony of Tessa, an alumna of our graduate program and current doctoral candidate in leadership studies. She says, I tell people all the time that the Abbey changed me, my life and my future, and I'm so grateful for that holy place and for my wonderful monk friends. I'm forever grateful that there was a place in the course for me. With regard to the impact of her professional development, Mary, another alumna of our graduate program, and an area manager of a cargo freight company offered the following reflection. Quote, I feel the experience of being at the Abbey has been one of the best ones of my life, personally and professionally. It helped me to understand the sense of the simple life, the feeling of freedom by not being attached to material things and the purpose of serving others, which brings happiness. At work, it has helped me to practice patience, and the power of managing people to truly serve others and help them reach happiness at work. Without a doubt in my mind, happy employees create the most successful and highly efficient teams when they are led not by a manager or a senior director, but by a true servant leader, 
unquote. Finally, Britta, an alumna who is an executive communications manager in a management software company said, quote, the Abbey has become one of my favorite places because of the people, the beauty, the peace, and how it allows me to get regrounded in what is important to me in life. The monks set an example to follow of humility, of how to care for others and remain committed to each other and their community, even when it gets tough. The biggest learning I have had is to keep working on my soul and journey to be pure of heart, to discover my true self and live authentically. This picture that you see here is actually a, a you know, a, a group photo, not of our students who most of them were in previous semesters, but this is actually a picture of Gonzaga alumni who come back to the monastery. Uh, we, we offer an alumni retreat at the monastery on a weekend twice a year, and we get uh, alumni returning to re-experience re -experience the, the monastic community and each other. Um, and they fly from all over the country to get there. So that's an indication of how important this experience of learning was for them. So one can talk about monastic hospitality theoretically as an important quality of servant leadership, but until the heart is touched by a direct experience of it, only then, as Father Kogenbach said, can the mind and body be challenged to change in ways that can positively shape the common good? And now what I'm do, I would like to do is uh, give it back to my colleague, uh, Yoon, uh, Dr. Yoon Trang, to uh, uh, put a, come about with our conclusion. Great. Thank you, Dr. Carey. Um, so this photo, this is uh, from, uh, on the one side, the sign, that's uh, this is from pre-pandemic times, but that's the sign that greets you when you pull into the monastery at Valiamo there. And then this is a photo of me when I experienced the class for the first time with uh, brother Peter Zhao, OSB, who originally uh, was imprisoned in China for a long time. This particular abbey has roots in China and they kind of uh, migrated over eventually after um, to try to flee communism and then they, they set up in uh, Southern California, right near the uh, epicenter of the San Andreas Fault for uh, you know, folks who are interested in geography. So they really are trying to be very free in case the world uh, takes them out, if that ever happens. But it's a, it's a, it's a very inspiring community. I, I'm interested, one of my areas of interest is kind of the intersection of spirituality and, and suffering. And so, you know, Brother Peter was uh, imprisoned for a very long time in China, and he's written several books about them. Uh, that is available at the, uh, the bookstore there and online. And I've, I've done some work on a, a Vietnamese uh, cardinal who was imprisoned uh, in Vietnam for a long time after 1975. So, so, that, so there's you know, scholarly interests and connections aside from the educational interests as well. And so it's been a really fruitful relationship for us at Gonzaga with our students, obviously, as you heard. Uh, and so to kind of start to kind of close things up here, I would, uh, a quote from, I know it's a Jesuit and not a Benedictine, but the, from the Jesuit guide to almost anything. He says, live for a few days at a Benedictine community and you will taste their hospitality and sense of community, right? Welcoming spirit. And it's not a surprise um, um, from that quote there. So to tell you where we went, uh, we started with some undergirding assumptions of uh, our paper, of our teaching and our scholarship some you know context of the signs of the times and how you know even our field of leadership and management is urging us to leverage contemplative context like benedict monasteries and then my colleague uh, michael carey dr carey talked about how you know we've integrated that in our graduate leadership education course and you heard from some student reflections and uh, thank you very much for your time and attention as we've shared uh, our paper strangers and aliens no longer the experience of monastic hospitality and community in a hybrid graduate leadership education course. Thank you very much.